80s and 90s horror fans, it is time to rejoice. You've seen his work, you're a fan of his art, and now you can wear artist Mark Schoenbach's sadist art designs. If you're a fan of cult classic horror, you know his work, you've seen it everywhere, from the Halloween franchise to Pool Party Massacre, whether it's at Slashback Video or Mac and Me, you will recognize his distinct style instantly. Now check out his latest stock, including R.L. Stein and Christopher Pike inspired merchandise. Visit sadistartdesigns.com and put some respect on your swag. Welcome to The Offering with Jerry Hara, the show where we can have a quiet and frank discussion as adults about the things that matter to me, or at least that I think matter to me. Please take a moment to subscribe to our show wherever you get fine podcasts, and hey, stay up to date on future episodes. Hey, what's up? It's your boy, Jerry Hara, and this week on The Offering, we're talking all about Summer Camp Slashers. You could have been anywhere else in the world, but you're here with me now, and that's all that matters. Dear listener, I hope you're having a wonderful week. Want to make sure that all your dreams are coming true. Now is the time. Draw that bath. Have that glass of wine. Maybe you roll a fucking joint. I don't know. But now it's your time. It's my time. We're talking about things that we both find mutually interesting as adults. A lot of different people will tell you that slashers and the slasher genre comes from many different places. Some people will tell you, oh, it's it's Dario Argento's uh, The Bird with the Crystal Plumage, uh, originating from uh, the giallo genre, giallo, whatever you want to say it, right? I'm an Italian-American, not an Italian. Whoa! Hot take. Um, The reality of it is, the reality of it is, is that slashers have quite a bit of different origins and come from different sources. Um, What we're talking about today is more the Americanized mythology. So we're going to be playing by U.S. rules only. Um, I'm not going to bring in all these foreign films that you're not aware of and you've never heard of and that influence. Enough of that nonsense. All right, let's let's stick with what we know. Good old United States of America exploitation because that is really what this genre is now some people will tell you it was black christmas the bob clark classic he brought us a christmas story and he brought us black christmas he's the, he's the gift that keeps on giving you know he gives you the the nice americana norman rockwell christmas and he gives you margot kidder getting strangled you know i mean you, you got it all uh black christmas is kind of where it starts uh as as a film it works uh based on And this is one thing I love about Black Christmas. The reason that it works is because you really never find out who the killer, like you know who the killer is, but they keep it very, very kind of ambiguous as to what this killer's motives are, what's the end game. And I will say this now, it definitely needs a critical reappraisal. Yes, I'm talking about the 2006 remake, which is a nasty piece of business. Uh, The Black Christmas remake, which is known as Black Xmas. If you haven't seen it this holiday season, make sure you pop it in. It, it's definitely good and it needs that love because it's one of those movies that it is grisly, it is violent, and it works and it has a sense of humor. Let's go back in time again. So 1973, 74, depending on what territory you were in, in the United States, movies opened slower, kind of started like a fire. You know, they'd open in one big market. Uh, And then kind of see how it did, you know, sometimes with some of the more grindhouse exploitation stuff, you open in a couple of drive-ins, see how it does. And then it spreads like, hey, it was pretty good. Um, Halloween, 1978, the John Carpenter classic. Some people will tell you that it uh, borrows more from German expressionistic cinema. People will tell you that it comes a little bit more from French New Wave and there's different things that he's doing. And yeah, I mean, John Carpenter was a film student. So duh, you're going to see these influences and whatnot. But Halloween 1978, John Carpenter's Halloween is a good movie. Like it's a solid movie to watch. It holds up. We watch it every year for Halloween. 
And I love it. it it's just from everything. It's a pitch perfect movie. Um, a lot of the tropes that we find in these other films start to come from Halloween. Now, in 1980, Sean Cunningham had a little production company in Connecticut and decided, hey, that Halloween movie made a lot of money. So he was smart enough to know that if he could turn around and make a movie quick enough, that he could make some money. And he said, who? There's this guy, Tom Savini from Dawn of the Dead. He could probably pull it off. And the thing is, Tom Savini is, is, I mean, God, he's so influential and he's such a great artist. But the secret of Tom Savini is that he will tell you this himself. He's a magician. He, it's a magic trick. And a lot of times it's not about having the money. It's just about creating an illusion. That's why his books are called Grand Illusion 1 and 2, because there's sleight of hand and it's like practical onset magic. The secret of Friday the 13th was that there are some badass, nasty kills. And there's a lot of them. Uh, people will tell you that the slasher genre moves at a rhythmic pace. You either need boobs or blood every 10 minutes, and there's no way around it, okay? You can pretend that you don't, but you do, okay? There is a rhythm and there is a pace, and Friday the 13th kind of set that tone. Friday the 13th. You may only see it once, but that will be enough. Friday, the 13th. Now, this film comes out May 13th. Uh, just recently had its 40th anniversary last year. Movie comes out and it does crazy business. Now, how does this work? Well, in the first Friday, the 13th, it's a bunch of kids and they're getting the camp ready. So believe it or not, even though it is a summer camp slasher, we never actually get to see campers. We never get to see a fully functional, realized summer camp. And it's funny because it took them until Friday the 13th part six, Jason lives to actually have kids in the movie. And I think that that definitely adds a layer of tension and of immediacy that the other Fridays don't have. Because if you go from Friday the 13th, the first one, all the way to six, there's really no children. There's no kids in jeopardy. And once they introduced it, it even became a component in the original NES game that was made in 1988. And in that 8-bit game, one of the things you had to do was keep checking the cabins to make sure that Jason was not murdering children. And I have to say, I don't know what's wrong with us as a society, but I love the fact that when I was growing up as a nine-year-old boy, I was playing a game that was about murdering children. I mean, the game wasn't about murdering children, but that was a big fucking component of it was murdering kids. And I love that. That's great. Uh, there's something wrong with me. I really need to see if I can get some help. Summer camp is one of those things. And, and this is the thing, talking about sleepaway camps. Okay, and not the movie. We'll get there. Don't worry. We're going to get the sleepaway camp. I know you all got upset for a second. Just hang on. Summer camp is one of those things that most people don't really have a reference point for because I feel like they were a part of the Americana that was happening in the 1950s, post World War II, more of the boomer generation where you're sending kids away for the summer because, hey, Dad's got a good job and he can afford it, you know, and plus it gets the kids out of the house for a week. They can have all kinds of loud, annoying sex or, you know what, not just be bothered with their kids. Everybody wants to take a break. I don't blame you. I'm not mad at you. It's okay. God bless you. So most people, I, I think by the time we rolled around to the 90s, um, even in the 80s, like sleepaway camps were kind of really expensive. Most people didn't have those experiences because of that. So a lot of times in these movies, obviously, it's a bunch of dumb white kids. And, and that's fine. I mean, it is what it is. They're, they're lambs for the slaughter. But I think realistically, socioeconomically, that was who could afford you know, upper middle class white people were the ones going to these summer camps. Um, and when I was a kid, I did day camp, which was okay. It's kind of one of those things like you go to the recreation center and 
You go for a few hours, your mother gets some sandy, hits the bottle a couple of times, comes back, picks you up, says, hey, let's go to McDonald's, I'm a little drunk, and throws up on herself in the drive-thru. That can happen. Did that happen? It might have happened. No, no. My mom was a weed lady. Bless her soul, she was a weed lady. My parents used to grow weed. Did I ever tell you about that? How is my family? Not, you know, I got to tell you, my whole family, I'm surprised we have not been brutally murdered by a man in a mask because my parents, they, they grew marijuana. Um, they also evaded their taxes between the years. <laughs> they also evaded their taxes between the years of 1982 and 1985. They did not. Pay. No, in, in all honesty, though, I'm surprised that my whole family has not been brutally murdered because... I mean, my parents definitely had sex at least once or twice. I've got brothers and sisters, so that happened. Uh, they grew weed. I mean, honestly, I would say I'm surprised they didn't murder my parents. Jesus. Knock on wood, right? Well, Friday the 13th, 1980 makes a ton of money. I mean, a shit ton. So ultimately, we are subjected to a deluge of copycats, um, you know, knockoffs and cheap ripoffs. When in and out, in it of itself, Friday the Thirteenth is a cheap knockoff of Halloween. It's basically getting to the good bits. Um, it's much more violent than Halloween because if you watch that John Carpenter film, it's largely bloodless. It's when we get to Friday the Thirteenth two years later that we get to see that type of on-screen carnage and hyper violence and to be perfectly honest with you the mpaa wasn't really ready for it they kind of just said ah it's some stupid movie that no one will care about whatever give it an r rating and call it a day oh boy that would come back to bite them in the ass because once they started making money in the second movie they were able to get under the radar and this is a hot take i don't care you're gonna be upset i enjoy friday the 13th part two far more than i enjoy the first one Part two, you've actually got some Jason. You've got a lot of hot chicks getting naked. I'll even go as far as to say some of the best looking women in the entire series. Um, grizzly, grizzly deaths. And it's also building up that mythology of Jason. There's a great opening scene where they're at a, you know, at the campfire. And again, it's the counselors getting the camp ready for the kids to arrive. So here we are in the sequel there is still no actual campers. It's not a functioning summer camp. It's just a bunch of horny counselors fooling around and slowly getting knocked off one by one. It's exactly what we came to see, you know, uh, to great effect or detriment, as you might say. I really like that second movie. The first movie, it's hard. It's hard to sit and watch that film. And I get it. Chicken before the egg thing. But ultimately, if you're going to sit down and you want a good starting point, start with part two. I think it's a better film. I think it's a more enjoyable film to watch with your friends. Uh, all these, these films, all these films on the list are, and you know, I can't include everything because some of my favorite slashers were like, were like really like weird ones that I didn't think that I would like. Like I really enjoy final exam. And that is <laughs> Final Exam is just a bunch of producers who are like, let's wholesale rip off everything we've seen. And there's absolutely no heart, no artistic merit. Uh, you know, look, you don't come to these movies for the acting, but you can tell when the person behind the camera gives a shit about what they're doing. And in Final Exam, no one cared. <laughs> um, most of the cast wasn't properly housed in Final Exam and they were hung over and or drunk and or high during the making of it. And boy, does it show. Even the stuntman who plays the killer, he almost got killed because obviously it was a non-union production and they were shooting it for five bucks. So safety was not a concern. And that's why we always got to go back to Uncle Lloyd. That's Lloyd Kaufman from Troma. And the number one rule in all of filmmaking for trauma is do not harm humans. Do not harm humans. Do not harm animals. Do be respectful of others' property. Uh, most of these films, all made in the 1980s, it's a very quick cycle because you have Halloween. Let's just say Halloween's the jumping off point. You've got prom night, you know, uh, Jamie Lee Curtis. You've got Terror Train, Jamie Lee Curtis. The cycle of the slasher film is incredibly quick and it's a, it, the real hardcore stuff that we consider 
the cornerstones of the genre, it, it, it's it's here and gone in a very quick fashion because you've got Halloween, which hits in like fall of 78, really starts to gain speed by like November, even into the holidays, people were seeing it because it was a word of mouth film. It opened small. So everybody who was going to cash in, it was like, well, we got to rip this off. We got to, we got to rip this off and we got to do it quick. So a lot of these films were made in such quick succession. It's such a, a small little window. Now there would be other films after 1982, but I will say in my humble opinion that I think the slasher genre peaks between the year of 1980 to 1982. Were there great movies made after that? Yeah, there's a couple here on the list. Fantastic films. But unfortunately, the real rise and fall is in that small two-year period. Uh, in 1981, we got The Burning. <laughs> Forward to midnight swims. Don't. Sneak on back to the campsite. Get some matches. Build us a hot fire. Don't be wrong. And if you're thinking about being with someone where no one can see you, don't. Because this summer, a legend of terror isn't just a campfire story anymore. They say he smashed his way through the bunk room door, just a mass of flames. Cried out! I will return! I will have my revenge! He lives on whatever he can catch. Right now, he's out there, watching, waiting. Who's there? What happened one summer five years ago is about to happen again. And again, and again. The Burning. Now, The Burning is a quintessential piece of slasher filmmaking. <sighs> Trigger warning. The Weinsteins produced this film. And this is before they were the Weinsteins. Uh, you know, this is kind of, they were just starting out. They had another film called Alone in the Dark the year before. It's directed by Jack Shoulder, who did Nightmare on Elm Street 2, Freddy's Revenge. Um, the poster art for that film was like a dude with an axe, and it was very much slasher film art, but the film itself is not a slasher film. The Burning is. And The Burning is based on the Staten Island urban legend of Cropsey. Cropsey is the caretaker, the gardener, the guy who might be a little bit slow, but in The Burning, he's a damn near pervert. And I gotta tell you, that's something you don't see in movies anymore. You don't just see perverts. You know, just some old guy who's just whacking it and he's all... Bleh, bleh, bleh. You know, I like that. I, I, I like a good pervert in a movie because you know he's going to get his comeuppance. But The Burning is such a nasty piece of business. It is a dirty, sleazy film. Um, now, the Weinsteins obviously would go on to make all these Academy Award winning films and Miramax and everything else. Just, Just, you know incredibly storied career aside from all the terrible things that would transpire. Don't even want to speak on it. We're not going to speak on it. I'm not even going to say his name. They made this movie in upstate New York. Um, you got Jason Alexander is in this, uh, obviously pretty Seinfeld, but you have a bunch of kids that go to a summer camp and they're going to do some white water rafting. They're going to do this, that, and the other thing. But the legend really goes on the Staten Island premise of Cropsey. And Cropsey is this caretaker that ultimately gets set on fire. And then like, oh my God, he died in the fire. Well, guess what? Cropsey didn't die in the fire. He's now just hideously disfigured and he wants revenge. The burning sets up. And now it's crazy because literally Friday the 13th part two, which did amazing bank too, like it's like a couple of months so Friday the 13th Part 2 and The Burning were made almost simultaneously. But here's the caveat, and this is, this is where The Burning wins. Well, they were offering a lot more money, and their start date was literally two weeks before Friday 2. They got Tom Savini. Now, that's the secret. 
because the burning has got some amazing gore. I mean, it is repulsive and I love it. Uh, not to spoil anything, but there's a scene in the middle of the film that we had never seen before. You don't really see sense. Well, you see it now, but it's not the same with CGI blood. Don't, don't. CGI blood is good for embellishment, but you can't rely completely on it. There is a scene with a bunch of kids on a dock and it's the middle of the day and they all just get massacred by Cropsy. It's like six kids. You don't see that kind of level of ultra violence anymore in film regardless, but it was almost like Tom Savini's ultimate magic trick. You know, I can kill people at night where we can obscure the effects. We can obscure things. There was no obscure. You, you had to show it. So this was one of those cases where he took the arrow through the throat of Kevin Bacon in the first Friday the 13th. He took kind of that to the next level with that whole massacre scene. The burning works. Um, it's nasty. It's exploitive. It's incredibly violent. But I love it. I think it's one of the best entries in the Summer Camp Slasher series. I, I, I have to say it. And it's so usually influential, but it gets kind of lost in the shuffle. Because at that time, the one that was ruling the box office was Friday the 13th, and they were all ripping it off. In fact, fun fact, um, this is what you see when you go to the movies, and it's like, did you know? Um, Friday the 13th Part 2, the turnaround, May 13th, 1980, the original film comes out, and then literally by like the end of April, the second movie is out. So that was like a, an incredible turnaround to make a sequel. The only time that we would see that again would be with the Saw franchise, where it just became a yearly entry. And there's something to be said about, we talk, there's a rhythmic pace to slasher films. If you're going to stay within the consciousness of the viewer, it happens in a very quick succession. And I assume now with streaming, downloading, it happens even quicker. The genre moves so quickly in the beginning of the 80s that it can't keep up with itself. It can't sustain the pace. Now, with Saw, with the Saw franchise flashing forward, you had Saw did very well. Saw 2 did even better. And then Saw 3 is kind of the apex of it. And we saw the same thing with the Friday the 13th franchise where, yeah, I mean, in part, Friday the 13th 3D is really elevated because it, it has 3D. And at that time, it was new. They hadn't done it since, like, they had some stuff in the 70s, like, coming at you. And there's a couple of martial arts films. But the real heyday of 3D was 1960s, like Preacher from the Black Lagoon. Um this was a new process. You had Jaws 3D at that same time, which is just terrible. I love it. It's absolutely a terrible movie and no one should watch it, but I enjoy it. Uh, same thing with Friday the 13th Part 3D. It's one of my favorites. And again, <laughs> Part 3D is another movie where you have a bunch of people that are getting a summer camp ready, but there's no actual kids. Don't worry. We're going to remedy that. It's, it's coming, folks. Um, in the cycle you have these movies that just tend to, they're aping the success of the last film and they know, okay, well, if we put enough of those components in this film, it'll work. And here's the thing, you got people, they're making these movies for under $5 million, even in 1980 money, that's cheap. And you're getting this gigantic return in some cases, you know, $30 million. So it was kind of just Good sense. And when I say under $5 million, I'm being generous. A lot of these movies were made for under two. Let's be honest. You have Madman comes out that time. That's a summer camp slasher. And uh, Madman is is just, there's this behemoth of a guy and he's, he's killing everyone. And I never liked Madman because even though it's a slasher film, something about it just feels real country and dirty. Feels really like backwater hick type stuff. And the other thing, too, about Madman is that it's a big, hulking, fat guy. And that's just not very exciting. Like, I'm not trying to be a dick or anything. I'm just saying, like, it's just a big, fat guy in overalls and bare feet. I don't know. Like, I feel that if maybe he stepped on a glass bottle, it just wouldn't be that scary. He was a farmer, wife and two children. We used to live in that old house behind those trees. 
for no apparent reason, went stark, raving mad. He walked into his bedroom. The bodies of his wife and children have never been found. And if he hears you call his name, he'll come for you. Come and get us, madman! So, yeah, I'm acknowledging Madman, but I'm officially going on record saying that I am not a fan of the film. Oh, for all three of you Madman <laughs> fans out there, I know you're going to hate me. I'm waiting for the at me's. You're listening to The Offering with Jerry Hara. Got a question or a story you want to share with me? It might be featured in a future episode. Email me at jerryhara at gmail.com or hit me up on Twitter at Jerry Hara. I'm also on Instagram. You can find me there at Jerry Hara. Rate and review this show on Apple Podcasts, and you might find your review in an upcoming episode. And if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to The Offering. Now back to the show. Ah, here we go. Now, this is the sweet spot. Again, the burning, one of the most influential, the second most influential, or even more so because it was a bigger hit, Sleepaway Camp. Dear Mom and Dad, I've been at Sleepaway Camp for almost three weeks and I'm getting very scared. Welcome to Sleepaway Camp. Someone is watching you. Hey, Baba Reba! Someone is waiting for you. Someone wants to scare you to death. Turn it! Turn the wheel! Oh my God! Sleep away, camp. You won't be coming home. Sleep away, camp was another movie that was made in upstate New York. And it is utterly charming. It is... You have movies, uh, one of my favorites, Wet Hot American Summer, which you can feel the echoed sentiment because Wet Hot wasn't shot too far from where they shot Sleepaway Camp. It's upstate New York. It all kind of looks the same anyway. Uh, Sleepaway Camp is another really exploitive, nasty piece of business. And again, that's fine. I liked that. I like Down and Dirty and Sleazy. But they got all these actors that were basically from New York, and they had very New York accents, if you understand what I'm saying. And I liked it because they had these little kids, and all the little kids were cursing. And that was kind of novel, but it's not just that they were cursing, it's that they were really good at it. You know, like, you shouldn't be 12 years old and be able to curse like you've got a mortgage, three kids, and you just got laid off. Like, that's... You know, it's like a 12 year old kid, and he's like, Hey, maybe I want some fucking soda, you little. You know, it's like, Jesus Christ, why are you talking like that? But that's part of the charm of the film. And Sleepaway Camp uh, is, is definitely a little more of a Friday the 13th ripoff um, in the fact that you've got a faceless serial killer. So we saw the resurgence of uh, whodunits, and we're, we're about to get a tidal wave of whodunits because of Knives Out. Uh, Knives Out, just a fantastic film. Ryan Johnson. Yeah, I, I think what it is is that I heard that guy's name so much with The Last Jedi because nobody called The Last Jedi The Last Jedi. Everybody called it Ryan Johnson's The Last Jedi. R Ryan Johnson fucked up everything. Ryan Johnson. Yeah, you just wait for Kathleen Kennedy to make her mark. And then, yeah, exactly. Ryan Johnson, not so much the bad guy. I like The Last Jedi. I think it's a beautiful film. I think it's got a lot more going on for it. I just want to say, and I've, I've been wanting to get this off my chest. The Star Wars, the three new movies that we got, Force Awakens and on, had great trailers. That was the secret. Because I'll tell you what, you couldn't fucking pay me to go watch some of those movies again. But I, I'll watch those trailers. They were great trailers. Because I felt like the new Star Wars films, I felt like I was in an abusive relationship. Where it was like, oh man, that was terrible. And then like they came back as the jilted lover and we're like, oh, don't worry, baby. This next one's going to be really good. I'm going to make it up to you. Oh, you got Ryan Johnson. Oh, this looks pretty good. And then you see the movie and it's just a piece of shit. And it all ultimately ends 
Recently, we had just been uncovered with the news that director-producer J.J. Abrams admitted that there was no plan. And that pretty much sums up the problems with all of the new, modern, the last three Skywalker stories. Great trailers, though. If you have some time, watch those three trailers in succession. You don't even need to see the movie. In fact, there's scenes that are in those trailers that aren't in the movies. And they're doing that just to sell the movie to you. Sleepaway Camp didn't need to do that. Sleepaway Camp came out uh, right up against, I believe it was The Empire Strikes Back. And it was able to kind of secure a foothold. Like in in certain markets, it came in number one. And and that was incredible. It, It was the little film that could. It is a cheap film. You do not have the Tom Savini effects. I mean, it, it's stuff that you could throw together with, you know, it's just, the effects are not there. Uh, the pacing isn't there. But what it does do is it's a batshit loony, loony film. Um, the tone is all off. Tonally, the film changes from one scene to the next. There's nothing consistent other than the summer camp. Um, and the reason I like Sleepaway Camp is because And the reason I like a lot of these movies is because they're not populated by actors. And when I say actors, they're not populated by names. Like now, it's very difficult for me to watch a movie with Angelina Jolie. Because when she's in it, I just say, oh, it's Angelina Jolie. Because she's become such a big personality uh, off screen that you instantly associate all these other... You associate the actual real life of this person. So the, the secret to a lot of these films is that they're unknown actors. In some cases, this would be the only movie that they ever did. So there's something real and genuine about Sleepaway Camp. It's one of those movies that just sticks with you. And you say to yourself, well, it's not a very good movie, but there's just something about it. And it works in that whodunit frame, okay? And like I said, put all your money right now in whodunits. Whodunits are gonna be the next big thing. I mean, like I said, Ryan Johnson, uh, Daniel Craig, they just signed a deal with Netflix for two more movies. Both of them netted $40 million in their pockets on top of the production budgets, which is like insane. But hey, good for them, right? It's like, it's kind of like when you see somebody win the lottery. You're like, oh man, I wish I could win the lottery. But that person gives you hope. You're like, hey, if that guy won the lottery, maybe I can. And, And that's basically how you do that because only one person can win. Who knows? The lottery might be a scam. I'm not even sure. That's a whole nother episode. Sleepaway Camp succeeds because it has a killer unforgettable ending, which I'm not going to spoil for you because chances are, if you haven't seen this film, you need to go and do it. Also, you've got kids and they're real kids. Okay. There is a grit and reality to it. It's kind of like one of the big movies that we grew up with was uh, Stand By Me. And Stand By Me is really a great film because the kids feel real. And that's important. You have to have that point of view where you're grounded. And for better or worse, with or without its charms or lack thereof, Sleepaway Camp works because it feels grounded. The kids who are the protagonists in the film feel like real kids. And that's something you weren't getting in the other movies. You know, you had cheerleader camps, you had... All kinds of things, but that just seemed like a bunch of older kids. Like me, if you were growing up in the era of VHS, you saw kids in films, and you're like, oh my. I mean, I remember seeing Pet Cemetery as a kid. And there's two types of directors. There's directors who will kill a kid, and there's directors who won't. And uh, seeing Gage get Cage, Gage, I can't even say, I just, I've read the book, whatever. It's semantics, tomato, tomato. Seeing a child get murdered on the big screen in fantastic fashion, you know, getting run over by a 16-wheeler, mm, chef's kiss. You can't, you can't get any better than that, folks. No, what it is is it's just shocking. If you're a child, you're like, you watch like TV shows, you know, The Incredible Hulk, and there's children might be in danger, but they're never murdered, you know? And I think that's part of the sick and sad uh, charm of Sleepaway Camp. I can't recommend it enough. Some people love the sequels. I don't. I think they're terrible. Uh, the second sequel is okay because it's it's trashy enough and it's Bruce Springsteen's sister. The original character of Angela is now played by another older woman. 
And look, they were trying to cash in, but that came later in the cycle because there was a couple of disputes as to who owned the rights. So Sleepaway Camp was not afforded the luxury of, boom, we're going to make another one. Boom, we're going to make another one. And that's really where it comes in. We've got some honorable mentions. Honorable mentions. We've got The Final Terror, um, which is a film that was made in 1982 and largely edited down because the producers did not want to give in to all the gore. And The Final Terror has some notable actors. Uh, most notably, uh, Daryl Hannah is in The Final Terror. And it's got such a great title, The Final Terror. Man, I'm sold on that title. Uh, they recently did a remaster of it, but unfortunately, all the gore that they cut out and the murderous stuff, it's all gone because all those negatives, just like the Friday the 13th movies, you want to believe that it's sitting around in some Area 51 containment unit with the, you know, the Ark of the Covenant, but unfortunately, a lot of those elements are lost to time. Uh, that footage just doesn't exist. So the final terror becomes kind of like a toothless version of a summer camp uh, slasher where it's like, oh, it's got all the components there, uh, but it's just not quite, it doesn't have the teeth. You don't have the boobs. You don't have the blood because they tried to get it. Now, listen, if they made this movie today, it would be rated R. But for whatever reason, the producers were like, hey, we got to get it down to a PG. And we're talking in 1982 uh, on the cheaper side. And there's people who absolutely love this movie, but uh, I can see the charm of it because it is so amateurishly made. Don't go in the woods alone. Not just don't go in the woods, don't go in the woods alone. This was a movie that was shot in the Midwest very cheaply. It's exactly what you think it is. Mm, is it a summer camp slasher? Sort of. It's, you know, a bunch of hikers and random people getting killed too, so it's kind of not. But it, it does take place in a state park. I just don't like Don't Go in the Woods. It's got a great title. Again, great title. Terrible movie. Largely... That's the thing. These movies were summer camp slashers were aimed at young people, um, even more so to the younger kids, because, oh, wow, you thought like, you know, it was like this cool thing. Uh, you know, I'd hear like my cousin would come back from the movies and he would be like 16, 17. And be like, oh, I just saw this. And it was like, oh, wow, you got to see a Friday the 13th film like in a theater. You mean you didn't have to like sneak it because. My parents were very big fans of the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise, and they were fine with me watching those films because I think what my father always drove home was that there's artistic integrity, and these are fantasy films, and they're trying to say something. You know, they're, they're speaking largely more so than you think they are. There is something in the subconscious happening. You know, whether it was the effects artist, whether it was the writer, um, the Nightmare on Elm Street films are just... They're high art in comparison to a lot of the slashers. My parents were cool with that. So I was very thankful for that. But my parents did not like me watching the Friday the 13th films, which essentially made me obsessed with slasher films because it was a forbidden thing. And why was it a forbidden thing? Because my mom always used to say, there's, there's no, this is sleaze. This is exploitation. You know, it's a freak show. It, it's something that you're not supposed to see. There's no artistic merit. There's nothing. It's just, it's the same old thing over and over again. It's formula. And that formula worked for a long time. But I think largely most of my generation experienced these films through VHS. Now, there was a place by me called Show and Tell Video that I grew up, where I grew up in Brentwood and here in New York. And they had this deal on the weekends. And the deal was... All you had to do was rent two new movies and you got three old movies for free. Now, buy, rent two, get three free. I mean, that's, that's a bargain. You had to have the coupon. And uh, my father used to call the guy Mr. Dick Nose because the guy had a nose that looked like a, a penis. And he, he would always get upset because they wouldn't have enough copies of Footloose. I don't know what was going on there. But it was a good deal because my parents would rent all the hits of the day you know, your top guns and whatnot. And then I was left to my own devices to explore the dirty subculture. Because here's the thing. 
You could be interested in porn. You could be interested in sports. You could be, in, it doesn't matter. When you went into a video store, largely what sold those movies was the box art. So you didn't know anything about the final terror. You didn't know anything about don't go in the woods alone. But if it had a killer box, that kind of sold it. I mean, even now with the collectibles, you've got NECA and they're making great stuff with their Ultimates line. But essentially what you're really buying even there, it's the box. You're buying a larger version of the VHS box that you grew up with. So it really hits that sweet spot for a lot of us. Most of us could not afford to go to a sleepaway camp but we could afford the rent to get three free. So that was really kind of tangentially my experience with summer camp. Um, largely it was, oh boy, it's summer. You know, what's the nastiest film we can find where a bunch of people get murdered and we get to see breasts. I was always getting in some kind of trouble. I got in trouble once we went to, speaking of Miss Dick Nose, we used to, we went to the video store and you know me, I always got to go poking and prodding around where my nose don't belong. And I want to say I was probably about seven or eight years old and I went into the adult section. And it was very embarrassing because people forget what a social hub video stores used to be. So you might see the local priest uh, in the video store. You might see all the people at the PTA meetings and your friends and neighbors so there's nothing more embarrassing than bringing your seven-year-old child and dragging them out of the uh, adult room. Because back in the old days, the real way a lot of these mom and pops survived and thrived, especially when Blockbuster came on the scene, was by having adult videos. And generally, it was either some kind of trashy beaded curtain or it was like the old opening Dutch door, saloon doors that were, it was kind of like, hey, no one under 18 beyond this point. Now, of course, anytime you set a limitation with children, they're going to want to, you know, it's like habitual line stepper that pretty much st that sums up my entire childhood was just don't do that. And then I did it. So it was very embarrassing for my family that they dragged me out of the adult section and getting caught with porn in school. I have an even worse story, but I'm going to save that for another day. Largely, my generation, we experienced these films through the technology and the joy that was VHS. And some of us got to see a lot of these films uh, on cable because cable was a new thing. And there were only so many movies that they could afford to buy the rights to. So they'd get a package of movies. And Jesus Christ, did they play those movies? I saw Grease 2 one summer probably about 70 times because it was all they had. That was it. You, you know, like... They would show like Firefox with like Clint Eastwood. And then like right after that, it was like the same movies. It was like a track. It was just a package of films. And I remember one night uh, staying up really late because I looked on, on HBO and it said, oh, excuse me. No, this was, this was, we never had Showtime, but Showtime had a free like weekend. And that was a big deal. I got excited. I would get my VHS tapes and I would record all the movies and all the stuff I couldn't see. Now... I looked and I was like, wow, I think it's like 11 o'clock at night, Friday the 13th part two is going to be on. And again, whatever is forbidden becomes truly your fantasy because you're not allowed to do it. I stayed up late. Okay. And by the grace of God, my parents went to bed early that night. And boy, oh boy, I'm a young kid sitting in the basement alone on a Friday night watching Friday the 13th part two. I was so excited. And scared. It was, it was, you know, kind of this thing like, ooh. And I think that's why I love Friday the 13th. Because my parents said, no, you can't see it. And uh, it's just exploitation. But I, I was in that basement. And I was so excited to be seeing that film. And um, you would record these movies. And you'd show them to your friends. And you'd trade them with your friends. And it was a very exciting time to be alive. Not like now. Everything's just terrible. Everything. You know what? If you're a kid right now, just pack it in. Everything's terrible. No, it was a different time. It was a much more simple time. Um, I think, like I said, it was more for the privileged people, but, you know, summer camps were really a thing. And it's Friday the 13th creates this entire subgenre of summer camp slashers. When 
in fact, yeah, it takes place at a summer camp, but there's no kids there. It's not functioning. And like I said, we wouldn't see that until later in the cycle. Uh, summer camp slashers are so nostalgic for a lot of people because you watch them in the summer. And that was the experience. You know, it was like, hey, let's let's find something scary to rent tonight. Oh, well, these kids are they're going to going to cheerleader camp. And I'm not counting cheerleader camp. I love cheerleader camp, but great poster. And that's another one. Cheerleader camp has this this young cheerleader. She's jumping up, she's busty, and she's got a skull for a face. Okay, I'm in. I'm sold. That's all you needed to do. And uh that's why even, you know, on these streaming services, they need to pay more attention to paying artists and making sure the art is there because people most of the time just doom scroll through streaming. I do it all the time where I'm just looking for a movie. And if the the thumbnail art does not catch your attention, you're not going to watch it. But Cheerleader Camp didn't have that problem. And that's a lot of what made these films so iconic was they had fantastic art. They had very uh, intricate and manipulative art you know, even the ones that didn't, like Faces of Death, it wasn't, it what artistically the box wasn't very good, but it was telling you that it was real. And this was something that you couldn't see anywhere else. Uh, there, you know, the internet didn't exist. So largely we got to experience these films tangentially, even if we didn't get to see them, we saw the boxes, we saw the posters. Uh, you, you had the rise of Fangoria. Uh, noted horror film magazine here in the United States. Obviously, it's an institution now. But at a certain time, you know, your parents would say, hey, I'm not going to buy you that magazine. So you would go to maybe a Borders Books, you go to Walden Books, whatever the big sellers were at the time. And you got to leaf through those magazines and see all the gory bits because it was Fangoria. And they knew that, you know, you wanted to see those things. And it's crazy because some of those photos were taken from a different angle. They weren't necessarily stills from the studio. So it's very much tied to the history of a lot of these films. You can go back and read a lot of old back issues of Fangoria, and you might be able to experience a lot of films that you loved growing up in a totally different way. And that that's always exciting because it's almost like new media. It's like found media. Well, being a kid in the 1980s was pretty cool. And summer camps were pretty cool. And that was what it was all about, you know? I think, um, for me, we used to go upstate. We'd go to Lake George, and you go on the lake. And it was more kind of like the great outdoors. So, yeah. <laughs> and I got to say, I really would have loved to see them uh, to do... Like, I would have loved to have seen John Candy be like the head counselor or the owner of a summer camp. He did Camp Candy, which was the cartoon on NBC, which only lasted like two seasons. It was still an entertaining cartoon, but I feel like the real money would have been a hybrid between a film like The Great Outdoors and a film like Cheerleader Camp. You know, I mean, if you have a comedic actor who's able to, you know, lend a little bit of, uh, you know, humor and gravitas to one of those things, it, it, it kind of, it kind of, uh, it lifts the whole production up. And in Sleepaway Camp, you have the camp owner, he, he's on site, and you have older counselors mixed in with those younger kids. Uh, in a lot of ways, with films like The Burning or Friday the 13th, the kids are older. They're not as relatable because they're older than you. They're, they always are. You know, uh, even though they're like seven, they're, they're playing 17, but like, you know, it's like Jason Alexander. You watch The Burning, Jason Alexander looked like he was 35 and he's like 18 when they made the movie. And it might shock you. You might say to yourself, oh, Jason Alexander was a good looking guy. He's in good shape in this movie. Because you look at George on Seinfeld and you're like, oh, wow. How did he go from this to that? And look, we all get old. It happens. I'm sorry. I, I don't know what to tell you. You know, it's it's part of life. You know, you start out as a beautiful flower. Next thing you know, you're a piece of shit. I don't know. Well, long story short, summer camp slashers are fond memories because it's about the nostalgia of summer itself. And that is what it's a celebration of. It's a celebration of 
No more school, no more teachers, no more dirty looks. You're going to enjoy yourself. You're going to watch a movie. You might see it with your family, your cousins, your friends. And it became one of these things where it was a badge of honor. If you were a certain age and you weren't old enough to go to the movies by yourself or you didn't have cool older brothers and sisters that would sneak you into movies, it was a badge of honor to have seen Sleepaway Camp. And the indelible impression that was left on so many viewers, I mean, (laughs) by the time I was 10 years old, I thought that if you went to sleepaway camp, you were smoking weed and fucking every night. Like, (laughs) that's that's what the movies told us, right? I I guess. So it looked kind of attractive. And the other thing, too, is there's, there's a point of view coming from, you know, the people who were underprivileged or lower class. Uh, hey, you know what? Fuck it. Kill all those crackers. <laughs> Who cares, right? Like, kill them. You know, like, they got too much money anyway. And these films, you know, they have archetypes early on in these films where it's like, oh, it's Betsy and she's the, the snobby rich girl, you know. And there are archetypes that live on in these series. You kind of always have a kid who's a nerd. You have a girl who's like the beautiful snobby girl, uh, the jock who sometimes the jock can be the hero, but usually the jock is the guy who's trying to nail the snobby girl. Uh, and we we don't like these characters um, because they're not good people. And they, they hold a, a standard of beauty, uh, maybe status that we don't have. So if we can't be them, let's destroy them. <laughs> That's really what happens is, well, I, I'm not the pretty girl. So I guess we'll just slit her throat because, hey, you know, that's what I want to see happen to the pretty girl who stole my boyfriend. These movies have a way of allowing people, especially young people in the 80s, to live vicariously through them. And that is a very important part of cinema. Um, You could say that Star Wars was just a kid's picture. It's a fantasy picture. It's stupid. But I think any film that allows young people to live vicariously through it and get some escapism, fantasy, some thrills and chills. It's not complicated, folks. You don't, you know, you don't have to put almond butter. Just, you can put the peanut butter. You don't have to get all fancy with it. I know right now, uh, jams have become very popular. Everybody's making jam. You know, I turned on the TV the other night. Just don't stop me. Pete, just let it roll. I turned on the TV the other night and it is an episode of Vice. They got this thing, Munchies, and I'm watching it. How to make your own hot sauce. I love hot sauce. I'm eating enough hot sauce to blow out my rectum. And uh, I'm watching the video and the guy's like, okay, first what you're going to need is like 50 to 60 chili peppers. And I was like, nope, that's it. I'm out. <laughs> like, dude, I'll spend five bucks. There's no way that I'm cutting 50 to 60 peppers to make hot sauce in my home. That just seems like a lot of work for very little reward. Yeah, but it's like, you know, you made, fuck that. No, I don't care. I will buy it. I don't even care if it has preservatives or lots of uh, sodium. I'm good. I'll just buy it for $5. And that's the thing. You might not have been able to afford to go to sleepaway camp, but if you had a coupon and you went to show and tell video, you could go to sleepaway camp. And you got to see all the breasts. You didn't even have to work for it. You just had to have a coupon and a couple of bucks. What are some of your favorite slasher movies? I mean, come on. Don't be honest. Uh, lie to me. No, I'm kidding. Be honest. Let me know. I'm on social media. You can yell at me. You can tell me I'm a piece of shit. Call me a human piece of garbage and stomp on me, and I'll be stroking while you're doing it. No. You need to get at me on social media. What are some of your favorite summer camp slashers? What are some of your favorite slasher films that you grew up with? I'm curious. I want to know. I have my lists. You have your lists. Let's get together and compare. Let's hope that you're a good looking woman because I am even more inclined to do so. I always want to share my notes with an attractive lady. Let it be known. Well, folks, unfortunately, we've run out of time. It happens. I know. Don't forget, uh, I'm always here. If you ever want to get in touch with me, you know, don't be shy. I'm just a normal guy like you who grew up in all these dopey horror movies, and I haven't murdered anybody. I've grown up. I'm pretty well adjusted. Could be worse, right? Uh, 
Well, that's it, folks. It's uh, that's another episode of the offering. I hope that you have a wonderful summer. I hope that it's a lot of fun, and you can tell me all about what you did over the summer and the fall. Uh, again, like I said, my name is Jerry Hara. This has been the offering, and peace of mind is priceless. You've been listening to The Offering with Jerry Hara. I'm very sorry. Produced by Pete Bune. If you have a question or a story you want to share with me, we'd love to hear from you. You can email me at jerryhara at gmail.com or hit us up at Twitter at Jerry Hara or on Instagram at Jerry Hara. You get in the picture? Subscribe to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever fine podcasts are provided for you and your family. I want you to enjoy. Just join us next time for another offer. I'm Tom. My partner Mike and I have been friends and co-workers for a long time. And at work, we're known for our daily water cooler conversations about TV shows and movies we are currently watching. Whether we're arguing over which Marvel TV show is the best or agreeing about which Netflix original movie is the worst, the pop culture conversation is always popping on Two Brothers at a Water Cooler. You can listen to Two Brothers at a Water Cooler on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever podcasts are available. Subscribe and share today.